Uh, software quality is directly related to defect density. Defect density is typically measured in defects per thousand lines of code, KLOGs, or KDSI, which is um, a thousand, uh, defects for delivered uh, source instructions. So um, a defect is anything for unexpected result. For example, missing functionality, specification issues, coding mistakes, design mistakes, misleading messages, and poor performance. Things that are not defects, lack of comments, misleading con comments, violations of coding standards, overly complex code, test defects. I really hate this code. Okay, so I'll note right here, uh, just to get a couple of you to calm down, I'll note right here that uh, <laughs> when we talk about code reviews, they do serve multiple purposes, including identifying and resolving problems that are technically not defects, but they're still deemed unacceptable to the development body, like coding standards. Okay. <clears throat> uh, mean time between failure is another quality metric typically used in formal reliability testing and estimation efforts it forms the general perception of customer quality. So for example, if your car breaks down every two weeks instead of every two years, that's going to affect your estimation of your car's quality. Um, MTBF also correlates to defect density, and it can be used to help estimate defect density if you don't know what your defect density is. Defects are usually introduced uh, in raw code in the 25 to 100 KLOC range. Um, defect introduction rate directly correlates to the project size, though. So, in fact, based on the initial defects per KLOC, a project can just be categorized as either small, intermediate, medium, large, or very large. Okay, enough of the metric stuff. Let's talk about work processes. So. Des design activities usually introdu introduce defects in uh, one to three defects per hour range. Coding activities usually introduce defects in the five to eight per hour range. And the, the whole process of uh, introducing defects itself is a separate topic for modeling and studying and software engineering. We're not really drilling down too far into that one today. Now, as far as removing those defects goes, some activities are better than others at detecting uh, the defects, and different activities find different kinds of defects. For example, missing functionality is not normally discovered by a unit test, because if the developer knew about that functionality, they'd have to know about to write a test for it, right? Um, another example, if there's some misunderstanding about how to properly use an external API, you're not going to find that with a unit test. Static analysis wouldn't find either one of those. So let's look at what some of the research tells us about the effectiveness of, the effectiveness of different activities as far as finding defects. So these are all median values from Steve McConnell's research and a couple other sources. Um, note that these percentages are composite. They're not overall. So you can't just add them up. Uh, at each stage, they, they find the percentage of defects that are still in the code after the last uh, activity was applied. So it's not really talking about percentage of overall defects. It's talking about defects that are there when that activity happened. Okay. So as you can see, formal inspection, uh, it stands out as an effective defect discovery method. Uh, and this is why NASA uses it, and they've published a really extensive guidebook on, on how to do that. Um, so, but without drilling too far down into any of these, there's one characteristic that all of them share, and that is every one of these activities has a diminishing return. So most of the benefit is gained by initial and basic efforts, and beyond that, you, you get into territory where it's, where it's a lot of extra work to get just a little benefit. So accordingly, the best place to be is in the sweet spot where you get the most bang for the buck. So if you want to be efficient and minimize the investment required to find your defects, remember, this is key, doing at least a mediocre job on lots of activities 
is better than doing a great job at few activities. So let's talk about some practical examples. I've made a couple of relevant models we can look at. First, there's the, the minimal model, and uh, a lot of, more than a few software projects use this model. And it's just, you know, write the code, run your system tests, maybe send it out for beta, ship it. Happens over and over. So, so to start off with, let's say developers have implemented all the code, and we're not taking into account system tests yet. But at this point, we're looking at 50 defects per KLOG. And here's a graphic representation of how dirty that code is. Not too good. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the project does system tests, and when we add those in, we can see the defect density drops down to about 30 defects per KLOC, and there's the corresponding graph. So next, the project either goes ahead and ships with 30, or and kind of lets the users be the beta, or they'll run a high volume beta to ring out more defects, and high volume betas are uh, more than 1,000 instances. Um, so taking that into account, you can bring the defect density down to seven and a half, which is still somewhat high, but it's roughly where they're going to stay unless they introduce more defect removal activities into the mix. So while that minimal quality investment is not uncommon, there's a lot of software projects that are for internal use. They don't enjoy the benefit of being able to use a beta. So uh, the question is, how do they lower their defect density? Well, for internal projects, it, it especially makes a lot of sense to bring these other methods into play. So let's look at a project that does a mediocre job of system tests, integration tests or component tests, unit tests, and static analysis. So notice beta testing's gone. Uh, because of these activities, right off the bat, the defect density is better. It's down to 6.1. Now, if that project also does design reviews and code reviews, they can cut this rate in half to three. Uh, now, there was a study done at Cisco by a company called SmartBear where they looked at code reviews in particular and how to optimize them. And according to their research, so, uh, they've identified some best practices that when you follow them, it brings code review effectiveness up to the same level as those formal code inspections I pointed out a, a, a minute ago. Um, so even though it's a lot less work, it's, a, it's about one-fifth the work, you get the same benefit. So taking this into account, when this reference model, we can get defect density down below 1.6. So now we're starting to approach some better quality levels. And if you want to be even lower, uh, you can add more defect removal activities or step up the ones that we've already talked about because I use the median values to calculate this. Um, Typically, a data center quality level is 0.1, not 1.6. And uh, avionics and medical are, you know, areas where you'd want it even lower. So what are the best practices for code reviews? And we'll go through them. This is the blue sky part. OK, so the first one is watch the workload. So normally, we'd expect to find you know, about 50 defects per KLOG for new code with, without taking into account unit tests and all that. And uh, of course, depending on the size of the, size of the project, uh, the development practices, et cetera, um, you can expect a code review to find 30 to 60% of the defects. Um, so the portion of defects that are found are a measure of the, code's review of the code reviewer's effectiveness. But curiously, from the research data, there appears to be a hard stop right around 400 lines. Um, so beyond that, uh, code reviews pretty much lose their effectiveness. So accordingly, it's better to have smaller, more frequent reviews than have heavyweight ones with the line being somewhere under 400 lines changed. So if you're doing a refactor for a new feature, think about doing the refactor checking that in, doing the code review, then taking that, adding the feature, checking that in, doing another code review, for example. So next one, slow down. So similarly, and this one's not at all surprising, the faster you blow through the code review, the more defects you're gonna miss. 
but then the question is, well, how fast is too fast? Well, from the relevant data, it looks like the found defect density drops off right around 500 lines per hour. It's also pretty clear from the data that reviewing rates of 1,000 lines per hour, it's only slightly better than just not doing a review. For reviewers, for reviewers, any changes that the reviewer thought was worth reviewing is at least spending you know, five minutes on, even one line changes can introduce defects. So if they put it in there, consider it and think about it. Next one, not too slow. So it doesn't, it doesn't pay to take too much time either. So the, the attention span of reviewers drops off at around 60 to 90 minutes on a review. So putting this together with the last two slides, reviews should be less than 400 lines of code and should take less than an hour. One idea that they tested at Cisco with the study was the, the notion that author preparation could increase found defects and uh, eliminate them before the review even began. So the theory is that when authors go through and annotate their changes uh, in the code review tool to guide the reviewer through the changes in, in a rational order, uh, reconsidering the rationale behind each modification not only does it help the reviewers understand the review, but it causes the author to rethink and re-examine all the changes, and they're going to find some defects themselves right there in the process of preparation. So as you, as you can see, the data seem to support this. Uh, Well-prepared well -prepared reviews um, yielded fewer defects. Now, there was an alternative hypothesis that, when, uh, that the reviewers are just being less thorough when they saw a code that was well annotated. But that possibility was also separately examined and eliminated. The reviewers were being just as careful, it's just there weren't as many defects there to find. So teams should decide what measurable goals they're trying to achieve with their code review process. So not only does it give the team visibility to their own effectiveness, but it also defines a tangible benefit that reviewers can relate to, to keep their focus on performing effective reviews. So goals can be internally focused, like reduce defect density, increase MTBF, or um, defects per, you know, defects per uh, you know, your defect density, lower that your defect density. And those are all uh, immediate. They can be externally focused, like decrease support calls or decrease def defects reported by users. Um, you can do that. Those are a little more sluggish because depending on your release cycle, they can be delayed. That can be delayed feedback. So it's better to choose metrics that are gathered in an automated fashion, both for consistency and convenience. Once the charm wears off you and you lose your metrics if it's a manual effort. So making it automated so they're always there, much better. <coughs> so checklists for both authors and reviewers tend to increase the effectiveness of code reviews. So coding's complicated. There are a lot of things to remember. And uh, having both the author and the reviewer make sure the proper level of attention has been given to each area can make the process more efficient and more effective. In addition, since each developer is unique, there's, there's one other thing. Uh, while developers tend to learn from their mistakes, they also usually make the same 15 to 20 mistakes over and over. So. Having a personal checklist to remind developers to double check their own kind of weaknesses uh, and their own common mistakes can really pay off. A uh, surprising number of defects are found in a code review that go totally unrepaired. This can happen because code review defects are often not tracked in the same system as your other defects, or sometimes they just slip through the cracks. So it's better not to complete the review until suitable fixes are in place and can be verified. Be constructive. So managers and other technical leaders need to set the tone for having the kind of environment where finding a defect in a code review is a good thing. So code reviews are a means for developers to learn from each other and to develop in their careers. They're also an effective means of communication. So it's easy for an author to be put on the defensive for having made a mistake in the code. And it's easy for this to foster a certain degree of negativity about particular code reviews, about the code review process itself. 
So for the best outcome, the prevalent perception of code reviews needs to be that they're about successful teams working together to produce quality code as a team. Authors and reviewers are working together to improve the product, and they should take pride in the process. Code reuse can be looked on as a form of pair programming. So if junior developers are afraid of the code review process, it interferes with their ability to comfortably learn from the review process, and it means that more experienced developers aren't doing a great job of uh, helping these newer ones gain experience. So managers, if you're listening, hi. <laughs> Defects found in code reviews should never be the basis for negative performance reviews. You don't want to be big brother. <laughs> so when your, code review, when your code review tools automatically report metrics like how long a reviewer looked at each piece of code, it's very easy as a reviewer to transition into worrying about perceptions. You, you think, well, you know, I'm satisfied with this code, but it, the tool says I only looked at it for three minutes. Is that enough? I mean, are people going to think that's not long enough? Or, do I have to leave the window open for a little while so that it looks like I looked at it for longer? You know? um, what about statistics you know, on defects that are found in my code versus other people? Does that make me look bad? You know, am, I, am, I, am I being really mean if I mark a comment as a defect in the tool instead of just you know, leaving a comment to say, please fix it? So. The focus should be positive. It should be on productively writing quality code. Metrics can be used for good or bad. And if developers think metrics are used against them, code reviews will be perceived negatively. They'll receive poor acceptance. And even worse, developers are going to start focusing directly on improving their metrics rather than, rather than on writing quality code. So I'll say it again. Management should never, ever play big brother with the metrics. Metrics should be used to evaluate your development processes and your quality level not to nitpick individual developers. Um, found defect densities often correlate to the complexity of the change more than they do to the abilities of the developers. So think about it this way. Usually the most complex changes that introduce the most defects, and those are usually done by the experienced folks. So Aristotle said that well begun is half done. And a lot of times that's true. If a person's in a situation where they don't have time to, to complete a particular code review, it's better to give it a cursory review than none at all. So while you're not going to find as many defects uh, in, in that particular instance, the point behind this is if your habit is at least consistently addressing the review, the author's still going to anticipate that her, his or her code is going to be looked at, and they're likely going to do a better job of being prepared for the examination. So they'll catch more defects before the review even starts. So this effect isn't, uh, it's, it's not as prevalent when code reviews are often skipped and uh, entirely instead of uh, getting at least some attention. So if you absolutely need to only take a cursory approach to a review, you can get at least some benefit by reviewing a quarter to a third of the code. So over the decades, a lot of research has gone into practices of heavyweight code inspections. Heavyweight inspection is a rigid process, but it's effective. It takes about 18 hours for a 400-line code review. And this involves several participants, and many of those hours are tediously spent in joint meetings. So according to the research at Cisco, uh, while heavyweight reviews take five times as long, with the right tools and the best practices, your regular tool facilitated, facilitated reviews that we just talked about can find just as many bugs. They can be just as effective. Okay. So um, let me let me. I kind of went through them slowly. So let me just recap these real quick, and then we'll take take questions. Okay. Watch the workload. Take your time. Not too slow. Author preparation. Process improvement. Checklists. Verify your fixes. Be constructive. Beware, big brother. Something's better than nothing. Lightweight works. Okay, that's all I have. Any questions for me today? Yeah. Um, uh, he he um, he's asking any metrics on how many people to include in a review. Uh, not not in this study. I've seen I've seen that. Uh, 
in other information I've seen, between two and four is usually the best answer. Uh, after that, you're starting to get past the knee on the value curve. Yes? Well, that's a good question. Um, uh, his question is, how do you measure defects that never happen, pretty much? How do you measure somebody's ability to avoid putting defects in in the first place? Yeah. Um, well, uh, with, with that one, you, you can certainly measure the defects that are there. And so the difference is what you think the defects would normally be. So you'd have to use like an um, estimation for that and then, and then calculate the difference. Um, so, uh, since uh, you know, uh, since uh, it never actually happened, you can't you can't really measure it. You have to you have to estimate it. I would think. Any other questions? Yeah. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned um, setting goals based on automated metrics rather than your own your mm -hmm. own metrics. Mm -hmm. What metrics do you suggest? That you what automated metrics do you suggest you base that goals on? Okay, um, the question is, um, what automated metrics are best to, to uh, set your goals against? I think that depends on what your goals are, but a lot of the ones that are commonly used are trying to calculate and estimate your defect density, right? Um, is this code ready to ship or not? Well, no, because we've got you know these things that, didn't, that showed up that didn't used to. Do you have any unit tests that are uh, currently taken out of the mix because um, uh, because you know we we took them out for a while to get this to get this thing done, and you know did we ever put them back? Static analysis often gives folks a big heap of places that's rich with defects, and a lot of times that can gets kicked down the road. But you can look at those metrics, and uh, they'll tell you about some of your defect density as well. Um, again, there's there's things around trying to measure um, mean time between failure and testing and uh, externally reported defects. So how many, how many did we ship? You know, so, so those are our good ones as well. Uh, those aren't uh, necessarily automated, although if you do tra track all your defects in the same place, you, you could make them be that way. Yes, sir? Yeah. Yeah, so in a, in a code review, uh, the easiest thing is to just not close. Oh, sorry. Um, so the question is, uh, when we're verifying defects, what method is the best one to use to, to verify those? And um, when you're using a code review tool, uh, probably the best thing is to just not complete the defect until uh, the issue that you raised has, has been resolved. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of one of those uh, edge cases, but when you get an unexpected desirable outcome, uh, is that still classified as a defect? <laughs> <laughs> if it's, so what you'd want to do is, is, is okay. The question is, what if you get a, what if you get a, a, a I guess a, a behavior, what if you witness a behavior that's, that's uh, unexpected, but it's actually positive? Positive outcome. Um, so I'd, I'd point to the incorrect behavior part of the definition. Uh, if, if being super positive isn't incorrect, then it's not a defect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, the question is, what if in a code review you see something that's not going to cause a problem or incorrect behavior right now, but it is likely to be the source of an issue down the road? Um, my answer to that is, I, I wouldn't technically call it, call it a defect, but I would put it in, as a, in the code review tool as an issue that needs to be resolved and, and have them resolve it. Because there are things that you can enforce that are not defects, you know, like coding standard things and, and things like that. So if you see something that, you know, for example, oh my gosh, you know, we grow 10% and this code's gonna blow up, you know, under 10% more load, but if we go change it to do this thing, it's gonna be more robust. Or I got another feature that come in that I know about, and if we make this change, that, that thing's gonna be a lot easier to add later, you know, things like that. Those are all things that I would consider uh, marking as something that needs to be resolved in the code review and then taking care of it right off the bat so you don't push that technical debt down the road when somebody's right there looking at it is the best time usually uh, you know, to put it in as far as efficiency goes. Any other questions? Yes? Well, that's one of those, that's one, so a uh, question is, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> question is, uh, is there a mentality where you, you're, you don't, you, you kind of feel like you didn't do your job in a code review unless you find one thing right. to pick on somebody about, right? Uh, that's probably not a best practice. <laughs> um, but uh, if, if, it, if it's a legitimate thing, you're still doing your job. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, like the checklist, is there a, is there like a best practices checklist that that's out there? Is there a good resource for finding that? I don't know of one uh, personally, um, but. When a team puts its heads together, they can come up with a pretty extensive list, maybe maybe too many things on it even, in a hurry, because uh, engineers tend to be uh, very detail-oriented, and uh, you know it, you can you can certainly come up with one. Uh, even if you do find a, a list of best practices ones out there, you're still going to have to sync that back with the team because you know somebody's going to object to some of them, and somebody's going to have some other things that they want to add to it. And so what you kind of need to do is just come together as a group and do a little kumbaya and figure out what your, what your list is going to be. Yes? Um, you've talked a lot about quantity of defects, mm -hmm. but you haven't mentioned anything about severity. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the question is, we talked about quantity of defects, but we didn't really talk about severity of defects. And is there something that um, we should do in code reviews, or, or else or really, uh, that uh, emphasizes um, uh, trying to find areas, for trying to find defects in areas where there would be more severity? Um, so that, that's something that's particular to a particular project. In general, you know, the answer is yes. I'd, if, if I know that there's a certain part of code that's critical, right? I'm going to spend more time on that code in my code review than I will on, you know, the getters and setters, right? Um, it's also, uh, you know, talk, talking about, um, you know, the, the total defect removal group of activities, those critical areas are also worth spending more of your time on, you know, as far as developing tests for, right? So that you, um, there's a certain amount of expense and overhead associated with you know, integration tests and system tests and things like that. Um, and so, you know, there's always the question of if, if it's worth it. And, um, you know, basically two aspects of that. One of them is, is it likely to find a defect? And the other one is, you know, is it, if, if it does find a defect, how, how bad of a defect is it? And so I think that's how you prioritize where you focus all of that effort. Any other questions?
Okay, well, it looks like we're done with questions. Thanks, folks. Appreciate uh, y'all coming and. Uh...